As the world faces down the coronavirus, infectious disease experts are becoming central to our lives. Advising world leaders and us on how to survive. But these scientists aren't just battling a virus while under heavy media scrutiny. They're also fighting misinformation, politicized messaging, and even personal attacks. Their research, information, and advice is becoming even more critical as more variants emerge with unknown mutations. Scientists are often happy to be behind the scenes, working on experiments and trials, hoping to produce a success that may end up in an academic journal one day. But the pandemic has catapulted this next woman from the lab into the spotlight, like many of her scientific peers. Eugenia Corrales Aguila is a microbiologist and virologist at the University of Costa Rica and joins us now. How's it feel to suddenly be at the centre of government decision making? Well, it's a, a difficult task because, as you said, scientists tend to be in the lab and do experiments and trying to have like a introverted life. And um, because of this pandemic, we have to jump in and trying to give advice and try to give uh, our um, show what we know and what we can prove or not prove or have evidence for it. So it has been a, a difficult thing to do. Playing that advisory role, how much time does that leave you then in the lab? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Actually, uh, before coronavirus, I used to work with dengue and Zika virus, with arboviruses, and I have a lot of ongoing projects, and I also teach. I mean, I'm a professor. So it's um, difficult uh, to manage all the time to, in order to uh, read and learn everything from this new virus, uh, to see all the this tsunami of information that is coming from all the scientists all around the world and uh, to really uh, have time for other things. Actually, my life right now, it's like 80% of my day time is coronavirus and like 20% is teaching. So uh, I have neglected all other things. It, it feels like that for a lot of us, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, tell me, yeah. though, how, how much influence do you really have as an advisor? How much of all of that information that you get gets through to the politician? Well, that's a, a really good question because um, we science advisors have to learn that we have just to present the data, to, to present evidence and to uh, suggest things, but at the end, we are not the ones taking the decisions. We're no. just there trying the, the politician to make a better or the best decision that he or she can make. So it's kind of a difficult thing. For example, for me, it has been really, um, I have a lot of, of, of influence, for example, in diagnostics or, or how we handle the disease or how we uh, understand the virus or what's happening with all these new variants, as you said before. But um, the, the actual measures, like, for example, lockdown or economical consequence, having economical consequences, uh, it's part of what the politician should do. So I'm not that powerful, but um, I think that for at least here in Costa Rica, the government has been really good opening uh, for us, the scientists, this uh, slot so that we can go through and suggest. What about the message of masks then? Some scientists reportedly played that down to prevent a mass public rush on masks and ensure supplies to medical staff. What, what went wrong there? Well, I think we were naive, actually. All of us that used to study coronaviruses before, we, were, um, we knew about coronavirus SARS-1 and we knew that we, it were, we were able to control it. So when all the cases were starting to come up in China, we thought that maybe, well, this is this looks like SARS. Maybe it's something similar. Maybe we can control it in the same measures that we uh, used uh, in 2002 and 2003. And I think we were um, kind of hoping and naive that thinking that it was going to be like SARS-1. But we were surprised, actually. We, 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 we knew at that moment uh, after Wuhan went into lockdown and after China went into lockdown, that it was going to be um, quite a difficult time. 
and um, and I think that scientists were uh, kind of uh, biased, thinking that the pandemic was going to be another virus, like for example, an influenza virus. We were actually some of us were thinking about the coronavirus, and and they were there, mm. but we were not that um, sure. And I think it it was a problem, and the o, the WHO also was a little bit slow trying to to declare this an emergency and to, to prevent... But, but we're also seeing happened. the same problem with the vaccine. A, a, a lot of people are saying it's not 100%, but we know 95% is fantastic. It's one of the best vaccines we've ever had. It's, it's the best vaccine that we ever had. The problem is that these respiratory viruses, so the vaccine probably is not that 100% uh, effective preventing infection, but it's good preventing disease, severity, hospitalizations and dying. So it's a great vaccine. Actually, it's kind of, you have to wonder of this achievement, of this scientific achievement that was so good and so fast uh, and so effective, actually. I think it's a lot of misinformation and, and social, science, social, social networks that start to have this kind of, of conspiracy theories and all this stuff that it's kind of affecting how uh, scientists uh, show what's going on and, 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 be, and explain what's going on. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Eugenia, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Venezuela is battling surging coronavirus cases on top of a drawn out economic crisis. The lockdown's forcing thousands of people to pack up and leave, which is complicating the situation for Colombia. Carlos Duque watches the moment when, amidst cheering, he left the hospital. He's Colombian and spent 36 days in intensive care. There, he saw the havoc that COVID-19 has caused in the hospitals of Cucuta. In general, the attention of the doctors and nurses was very good. But I also saw that there are a lot of people who are left on their own, abandoned. You get there and you are practically left in a disposable diaper, connected to a machine. In an effort to curb the spread of the virus, authorities closed the Colombian-Venezuelan border. But that has not stopped the flow of people. Non-governmental organizations estimate that some 100,000 people continue to move between the two countries every day. They do it along illegal trails like this one, where the authorities are too overwhelmed to carry out any health checks. It puts more pressure on city hospitals. Some of them have reported a 100% bed occupancy. Someone who comes infected and crosses it using these illegal trails ends up being a spreader of the virus to everyone around him. And the number of people he can infect is really impossible to calculate. Coronavirus safety measures are barely respected in Cucuta. Many do not maintain social distancing or even wear a mask. Even without the illegal border crossings, Epidemiologists fear that a second wave could soon hit the region. That could bring the already alarming death toll in the border areas to new highs. And it's that part of the show where our science correspondent Derek Williams tackles your questions on the coronavirus. Which vaccine is currently the safest and most effective one? Around 10 different vaccines are currently being given on a, on a pretty wide scale to people in various countries around the world, but some still haven't completed trials or, or published all their data. Um, it would be irresponsible at this point to, to recommend one over others, but I'm happy to take a closer look at the two so far that have checked all of the boxes for emergency authorization in the EU. Um, both are what are called messenger RNA vaccines, and, and they're the first ever based on this technology platform to be approved. Uh, one was co-developed by German biotech company BioNTech and, and pharma giant Pfizer. Um, the second comes from a US-based biotech company called uh, Moderna. Uh, let's look at safety first. Um, both vaccines were tested in trials involving over 30,000 subjects. 
half received the vaccine, the other half were given a placebo. Um, some of the people who got the candidate vaccines reported mild issues, especially after the second dose, like, like headache or fatigue or, or pain at the injection site. Um, but those usually passed quickly with, with no major adverse events reported. Since they've been rolled out, a few dozen recipients have had more serious allergic reactions to them, what's called uh, anaphylaxis. But don't forget, the two vaccines have now been administered to tens of millions of people. Um, some deaths in fragile seniors in Norway who received the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine are also currently being investigated. And, and recommendations in the future might also change for that small group. But as of now, um, both candidates have lived up to expectations that they would be very safe to take. Um, possible long-term effects will only be revealed in time, of course, but there's no sign of any so far. When it comes to effectiveness, trials show the two pretty much neck and neck. Um, both the Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines prevented the development of COVID-19 symptoms in around 95% of the people who received both doses, which is an absolutely top-notch result. And we leave you with some advice from The Terminator, the legendary cyborg Hollywood star and former California governor Arnold Schwarzenegger was given the jab at the Dodger Stadium drive through site in Los Angeles. All right, I just got my vaccine and I will recommend it to anyone and everyone. Come with me if you want to live. <laughs>